हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू बाजीराव आई ए एस अकेडमी दी हिंदू न्यूज एनालिसिस इन टूडेज डिस्कशन वी विल हैव फ्यू वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर सो वी विल ट्राई एंड अंडरस्टैंड दोज न्यूज आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम द एग्जाम परस्पेक्टिव प्लीज रिमेंबर दिस विल बी इम्पॉर्टेंट फॉर बोथ प्रिलिम्स एंड मेन्स एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव now before proceeding into the discussion first try and understand the yesterday given question so the yesterday given practice question so yesterday i have given you one practice question with respect to bitcoins okay so i have already told you that bitcoins are a digital form of currency okay so the question is with reference to bitcoins sometimes seen in the news which one of the following statements is are correct so this is the question so the first statement says bitcoins are tracked by the central government or central banks of the countries so this statement is incorrect because bitcoins cannot be tracked by the central banks or the governments so there will be no regulatory control on these types of digital currencies by the governments or the central banks so therefore this statement is clearly incorrect the second statement says anyone with a bitcoin address can send and receive bitcoins from anyone else with a bitcoin address and this statement is correct okay so first statement is incorrect second statement is correct because anyone with a bitcoin address they can send or receive these bitcoins and third online payments can be sent without either side knowing the identity of the other so this statement is also correct so without even knowing the identity you can send bitcoins to someone else okay so because of this reason bitcoins are very often used for anonymous funding to terror activities and uh, drug trafficking human trafficking purchasing weapons for all those purposes bitcoins are being used as a medium of exchange so here statement 2 and statement 3 are correct and statement 1 is incorrect so the correct answer for this question is option b now let's proceed on to the today's practice question okay so the question is global methane tracker is a report released by which of the following agencies so the agencies which are given here international union for conservation of nature world wide fund for nature international renewable energy agency and international energy agency so you just answer this question in the comment section guys please try to answer these questions in the comment section so that you would be able to know who have released this global methane tracker okay so i'll give you the answer in the next session okay proceeding further the first very important news article we have been discussing about the election commission of india and the appointment of the election commissioners the supreme court's judgment with respect to the election commission of india and the election commissioners appointment all those things so recently one very important development was that we all know that the election commission of india is a multi member body since it is a multi member body it consists of one chief election commissioner and two election commissioners recently the central government has appointed two uh, election commissioners okay so we knew that earlier one election commissioner was resigned and the second election commissioner uh, his term was uh, over so therefore there was a vacancy and only chief election commissioner left with the election commission of india and recently the central government has appointed two more election commissioners okay taking it to its full strength now in this context we will understand how these two new election commissioners are appointed by the government what was the procedure that was followed uh, when i say procedure earlier the supreme court judgment there was a different procedure and that procedure purely uh, followed by the executive so there was a, an executive control in the appointment of chief election commissioner as well as the election commissioners but after the supreme court judgment the supreme court has said that there should be a committee and that committee consisting of prime minister leader of opposition in the lok sabha and chief justice of india so this should be the committee and this committee would recommend names to the president for appointments however the center has brought another act in the parliament and that particular act says that 
prime minister cabinet minister nominated by the prime minister and also the leader of opposition in the lok sabha would constitute a committee and that committee would recommend names to the president and in this particular legislation that is being passed by the parliament has excluded the chief justice of india and this is what we have discussed in our previous lectures now we'll try to understand how these two new election commissioners are being appointed okay so first the president recently appointed gyanesh kumar and sukhbir singh sandhu okay so he is sukhbir singh sandhu and gyanesh kumar as so uh, both of them are retired ias officers and both of them are appointed as the election commissioners okay so recently appointed by the president and now we all know that the election commission is a three member body and it consists of chief election commissioner and the election commissioners so these two officials are the first to be appointed under the law that is being brought by the central government so what was that law the law was the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners appointment conditions of service and term of office act 2023 so this was the act under which these two new election commissioners were appointed by the central government okay so this particular legislation has mandated that there should be a committee and that committee consisting of prime minister leader of opposition in the lok sabha and a cabinet minister who is nominated by the president will recommend the names to the president for the appointment of election commissioners as well as chief election commissioners so this particular act has also excluded the chief justice of india from its purview while recommending names for the appointment to the president okay so this was the actual issue and new appointments were made as per this particular legislation the legislation was the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners appointment conditions of service and term of office act 2023 and this is we have already discussed in our previous lectures and now we will understand how are these two new election commissioners were selected okay so how they were selected so in terms of new law that we have discussed previously so in terms of new law the two election commissioners were selected by a three member committee so the three member committee consisting of prime minister of india so that is prime minister narendra modi and union minister amit shah okay so because that part that particular committee also have that particular committee also have the cabinet minister okay that particular minister uh, committee also has the cabinet minister so therefore cabinet minister amit shah and the leader of opposition uh, of indian national congress in the lok sabha adhir ranjan choudhury okay because he is the leader of the largest party in the opposition and based on this particular committee the uh, two new election commissioners were appointed as per the new legislation however they were chosen out of a short listed panel of six names okay so there were six names a panel of six names and out of six names these two names were uh, chosen by this particular committee so then who prepares the panel of names for the appointment of election commissioner and chief election commissioner this is what we need to understand okay so this particular panel of names would be uh, recommended to this particular committee by uh, you know according to the act so there would be a search committee right first there would be a search committee and that particular search committee would recommend a panel of names to the uh, this particular three member selection committee now this search committee has also been mandated by the legislation that we have already discussed and this particular legislation is headed by union minister of law and justice and it also includes two officials of the rank of secretary to the government of india okay so this is the selection panel first the selection panel uh, uh, prepares a list of names okay so a list of names uh, and the very same list of names would be transferred or sent to the this particular committee for the appointment okay so this is how it actually happens so before what was the process before this so how, what was the earlier process so earlier process was article 324 we all know that indian constitution talks about uh, article 324 and it specifically deals with the election commission of india 
right so it deals with the election commission of india article 324 so this particular 324 of the indian constitution was superintendence direction and control of elections with respect to the election commission of india so all these powers uh, superintendence direction and control have been given to the election commission of india okay so this is the first see when i say what was the process before this so that actually means that before the supreme court judgment or before this particular legislation has been passed by the parliament what was the procedure so the procedure was appointment of both election commissioners as well as chief election commissioners were controlled by the executive okay so it is completely under the executive control and because of this reason we know in order to ensure independence for the election commission of india a petition was filed in the supreme court that the election commission of india appointments are controlled by the central government so therefore this has been impacting the independent functioning of the election commission of india so because of that reason the supreme court has delivered a judgment and it has also come up with a committee so what was the committee we have already discussed about that committee the committee consisting of prime minister leader of opposition in the lok sabha as well as the chief justice of india however the other thing that you need to understand here is that this committee will be valid as long as there will be no law in the parliament if parliament comes up with any legislation on the appointments of the election commissioner and chief election commissioners so this committee will no longer exist okay so this is what the supreme court has said in anup banarwal case banarwal case okay so now we have understood article 324 of the indian constitution so it also says that the election commission shall consist of chief election commissioner and such number of election commissioners as president may fix from time to time okay so the number the strength of the election commission of india will be decided by the president because article 324 says that the strength the number of election commissioners will be fixed by the president or fixed by the president from time to time okay so this provision was subjected to any law made by the parliament if there is any law that is being made by the parliament so the number of election commissioners or chief election commissioner would be based on the law that is being made by the parliament okay so here we have one chief election commissioner and two election commissioners so this is the usual process of appointment so on the other side we need to understand that however nearly 40 years from the adoption of the constitution the election commission of india was functioned as a single member body okay so it was just a single member body till 40 years however in october 1989 it has become a multi member body so election commission has become a multi member body after october 1989 because a law was enacted in the year 1991 so this particular law has fixed the conditions of service of chief election commissioners as well as election commissioners and amended in 1993 and this particular act of the parliament has made that the election commission of india is a multi member body and it consists of chief election commissioner and two other election commissioners however this particular legislation that was enacted in the year 1991 and amended in the year 1993 has not provided for the appointment process okay so this particular legislation is silent on the appointment process of the election commissioner so because of the silence of this particular legislation on the appointment it is completely under the executive control the executive has been appointing the election commissioners as well as the chief election commissioners so therefore in the absence of any particular process being laid down by the parliamentary law so in case no particular a uh, process for the appointment of election commissioners and chief election commissioners by the parliamentary law the president has been appointing the chief election commissioners as well as the election commissioners because there is no law that is being mandated by the law okay so there is no process for the appointment that is being mandated by the law so because of this reason the executive simply appointing the election commission uh, uh, you know election commission of india's members chief election commissioner as well as the other election commissioners 
Now that essentially means that uh, you know how uh, how was the process of electing election commissioner? First, you know the law commission. Sorry, uh, you know the Ministry of Law and Justice recommends some names to the Prime Minister. Okay, transfer some names to the Prime Minister. So. in the panel of names that is being forwarded by the ministry of law and justice one name would be recommended by the prime minister to the president for appointment as the election commissioner or the chief election commissioner so this is how the usual process of appointing the election commissioners and it is completely under the executive do you see any role for legislature or judiciary in the earlier appointment process judiciary or executive in uh, judiciary or legislature in the earlier appointment process of the uh, you know the chief election commissioner or election commissioners there is no involvement of these two agencies and there is no process in the parliament as well so it is completely under the executive domain so because of that reason a petitions were filed in the supreme court arguing that appointment to the election commission of india is arbitrary in nature because it is completely under the executive purview and that has been deviating the constitutional purpose and even the functioning of the election commission of india as well okay so when the petitions were filed in the supreme court the supreme court has come up with a one particular or one important judgment on this so what was the judgment the case was please remember this case the case was anup baranwal versus union of india case okay so this is anup baranwal versus union of india case and this particular case is you know chaired by five uh, member constitution bench okay so this was the five member constitution bench and this constitution bench has ruled that the power to appoint the chief election commissioners and election commissioners was not mean to be given exclusively to the executive in fact the constitutional makers also does not want the power to appoint the chief election commissioners completely to the executive so therefore this particular process would not be valid followed by that the supreme court has provided for an interim arrangement okay so so the supreme court has provided for an interim arrangement and this interim arrangement is for the appointment of chief election commissioners as well as the election commissioners however one thing that you need to understand here this interim arrangement would be valid as long as there will be a law on the parliament so if parliament comes up with any legislation over the appointment of the uh, uh, chief election commissioners or election commissioners so this particular arrangement would not be valid okay so so this is what the supreme court has said with respect to the appointment now in this interim arrangement there were three members okay so who, who are the three members the prime minister the leader of opposition in the lok sabha and at the same time the chief justice of india so a three member committee would recommend the names to the president for the appointment as the election commissioner or chief election commissioner so here you can see the involvement of the executive involvement of the legislature as well as the judiciary as well in the appointment process okay so however the parliament has responded to this judgment by passing a law so what was the law so the law was we have already discussed the chief election commissioners and other election commissioners conditions of service and tenure and appointment bill 2023 okay so parliament has enacted this 2023 act so this particular act has received the presidential assent and it was also notified in late december 2023 okay so this has provided for a particular uh, arrangement a particular process for the appointment of uh, the members to the election commission of india okay so however what was the process so that process has excluded the chief justice of india how because earlier the uh, the interim arrangement that is being provided by the supreme court include chief justice of india prime minister and also the leader of opposition in the lok sabha however on the other hand this particular parliamentary act on election commission of india 2023 has excluded the chief justice of india and included the cabinet minister in place of the chief justice of india 
okay so this was the arrangement that was provided by this particular law however this particular uh, legislation was criticized okay so why it was criticized because of few reasons so first and foremost reason for the criticism of this legislation is that this new act it has removed the chief justice of india from the selection panel and it has made a union minister a member in state okay so it has removed chief justice of india and included the cabinet minister instead of the chief justice of india so it gives a 2-1 majority in three member committee so therefore still executive controls the appointment of the election commissioner and chief election commissioner so because of this particular reason the new act has been widely criticized and what was the other reason so the petitions have approached the court again against the appointment of the new uh, chief election uh, the election commissioners also we have discussed that the election commissioners were appointed recently the petitioners have moved to the supreme court uh, saying that the appointment of the election commissioners is unconstitutional and it is against the supreme court's judgment okay so their primary argument the petitioners primary argument was that the act violates main principles in the constitution bench judgment okay so it has violated the main principles in the constitution bench judgment what are those principles the need for the need to free appointment process from the executive however if you look at this particular arrangement uh, that is sanctioned by this uh, new legislation that still maintains the control of the executive in the appointment process so therefore the petitioners have been arguing that the election commission of india need to be freed from the executive control so thereby we can ensure the constitutional role and independence of the election commission of india so this is what this particular article has been saying about the new uh, appointment process and new election commissioners appointment now let's move on to the next very important news article so this is also one of the very important article so kerala government moved to supreme court on president withholding the bills okay so this is a very long story we all knew that there was a uh, a clash or conflict between the elected government and the governor in the states like kerala tamil nadu and west bengal so now what happens uh, in kerala and tamil nadu was when state legislative assembly passes a bill the bill to become an act that must be given assent by the res governor okay so state legislative assembly passes a bill and the bill to become a act the state governor must give his assent however in kerala what happens was the governor of kerala mohammad orif okay mr mohammad orif khan has reserved the bill for the consideration of the president okay so we all know that certain bills the president the governor can give his assent and on the other hand certain bills the governor can uh, reserve them for the consideration of the president in the case of kerala mr mohammad arif khan uh, the governor of kerala state has reserved the bill for the consideration of the president however the problem is that the president withhold the consent president withhold her her consent to the bills she has not given her assent so far so because of this reason those bills have not become acts and the kerala government has decided to move to the supreme court on president's inaction over those bills or president withholding those bills okay so you can call them as pocket veto so president has not taken any decision president just simply withhold the assent to the bills now we will try and understand this in a detailed manner firstly understand the context so the context was kerala will challenge the withholding of the bills by the president before the supreme court okay so kerala will particularly challenge the legality of president draupadi murmu withholding her assent to the bills that are being passed by the kerala state legislature okay so in fact if you look at the kerala state legislature it had passed few bills okay what are those bills firstly kerala university law amendment bill 
2022 so this particular bill uh, has been planning to uh, remove the governor as the ch chancellor of state universities we all know that in different states governor is the chancellor of those universities so therefore this particular legislation has been planning to remove governor as the chancellor of state so after that the university law amendment bill 2022 and the university law amendment bill 2021 okay so overall seven bills that were referred to the president draupadi murmu in november 2023 however president draupadi murmu had withheld her assent to these bills that are being passed by the state legislative assembly because they are reserved by the governor to the president draupadi murmu so therefore there was an inaction on these bills and those bills have not become an acts so because of that reason the kerala government has decided to challenge these bills in the or the inaction by the president draupadi murmu in the parliament oh, sorry in the supreme court sorry so this unusual move of the kerala government will actually open the doors it is believed that it will open the doors for a new constitutional debate on the scope of judicial review of the decision of the president of india now what was the judicial review what is exactly the judicial review the judicial review is any executive or legislative action would be challenged on the grounds of <coughs> sorry unconstitutionality okay unconstitutionality of those legislative and executive actions would be challenged so now what the kerala government has been telling that the inaction on the part of the president with respect to the bills which are being passed by the state legislative assembly amounts to unconstitution or you know ultra wise so therefore because of that reason they are planning to challenge this in the supreme court okay so it is also believed that there will be a debate on the scope of judicial review on the decisions of the president of india and apart from that the state would contend that the legality of the president decisions and the factors that are influence them can be judicially reviewed okay so what are the major factors that have been impacting or influencing president draupadi murmu in giving her assent to the bills or withholding the assent to the bills so they will be judicially reviewed so in case of there is no valid reason under judicial review so they can it, the actions of president draupadi murmu can be termed as unconstitutional therefore she must give his or her assent now in this context we will understand briefly what exactly uh, the procedure when govern uh, when the state legislative assembly passes a bill so we will briefly understand the procedure also so article 200 of the indian constitution deals with this particular procedure this particular mechanism what should be the follow what should be the actual procedure so article 200 of the indian constitution says that there will be four options that are being given to the governor when a bill is being passed by the state legislative assembly okay so what are the four options before uh, the governor after state legislative assembly passes a bill for example if there is no leg uh, legislative council or there so if there is a legislative council also for the state first legislative assembly passes a bill and then passed it on to the legislative council now firstly the first option before the governor is he can give assent to the bills okay so the governor can give his assent to the bill and that becomes a law okay so after that the president can also withhold his assent to the bill and this is the second option that is being available with the governor so when we talk about the withholding assent of the governor so the governor can withhold the assent preventing the bill from becoming a law okay so when governor withholds his, his assent to the bill the bill will no longer become an act or oh, it, it will no longer become a law however the constitution lacks specific guidelines on which a governor may withhold his assent emphasizing there is a sparing and careful use of this particular power okay so there is no law there is no legislation there is no constitutional provisions so constitution is silent and there is a uh, you know legal vacuum also on this and which laws the governor can withhold okay so because of that reason there is also a controversy with respect to the powers of governor after that the third option that is being available with the governor is reserve the bills for the consideration of the president 
So in the Kerala's case, this is what has happened. So he reserved the bills for the consideration of the president and in fact sent those bills for the presidential consent as well. However, the president has not yet given her assent and she just simply withhold her assent. Okay, the governor can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president if it affects the powers of the high court. So it is clearly mandated that if it affects the powers and position of the high court, the governor can recommend the bills for the uh, consent of the president. And secondly, return for reconsideration is also an option available with the governor. So once state legislative assembly passes a bill and sends the bill for the governor's assent, the governor can resend the bill for the reconsideration. Okay, so in case if it is not a money bill, the governor can return it to the legislature for reconsideration. However, one thing that you need to understand here, if a state legislative assembly passes the very same bill with or without amendments, the governor is obligated to give his assent to the bill. Okay, the governor must give his assent to the bill in case of the bill which is sent, which is already sent for the reconsideration. Okay, so article 201 talks about the referral to the president. So the governor can also refer the bills for the president in certain matters. Okay, so if it encroaches upon any rights of the high court or at the governor's discretion a subject in the concurrent list, any subject which is in the concurrent list, if the governor feels that this particular matter uh, requires the assent of the president, he can uh, send those bills for the president. He can refer those bills for the president and this is where the conflict has started between Kerala and uh, the state uh, government as well as the central government. Okay, so I think I hope you have understood all the provisions with respect to the bills which are being passed. So what should be the course of action after a bill is duly passed by the state legislative assembly. Okay, now we will uh, try and understand certain discretionary powers of the uh, governor in this context. So there are certain constitutional discretionary powers uh, that a governor has as well as the situational discretion powers also. Now when we talk about the constitutional discretionary powers, one is when they have to reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. Okay, so this is constitutionally guaranteed discretionary power on the part of the governor and he cannot act as per his personal discretion here. Okay, whenever it is comes to, uh, whenever we are talking about the reserving bill for the consideration of the president, first thing. And secondly, when he has to recommend for president's rule in the state. So recommending personal, uh, president's rule is also a constitutional discretion but not personal discretion. Okay, so president's rule is declared under article 356 of the Indian constitution, article 356. Okay, so after that when given additional charge in the administration of union territory, so that is also a constitutional discretion of the governor. So after that the governor has certain situational discretion. So situational discretion is uh, you can say a personal discretion on the part of the governor. So situational discretion with respect to appointing the chief minister after no party gets the clear majority when incumbent dies in the office. And secondly, when he dismisses uh, or uh, this is also part of it. Okay, So council of ministers on an inability to prove confidence in the legislative assembly. So in that case also there will be a situational discretion. So after that, when he dissolves the assembly, when it loses its majority. So in that case also the situational uh, discretion. Situational discretion is personal discretion of the governor. Okay. However, on the other hand, the constitutional discretion is constitutionally mandated discretion of the governor. Okay, so here uh, Supreme Court has said that the execution of the discretion beyond constitutionally permissible or constitutional permissibility is actually considered as attack on the elected government of the state and people's mandate because the elected government in the state is elected by the mandate of the people and if governor uh, acts as per his discretion if governor is not acting as per the constitutional discretion then it amounts to the attack on the elected government and people's mandate as well it is what supreme court has said now here i would like to tell you that for example i have already told you that if a bill is passed by the state legislative assembly and send the bill for the consideration of the president, uh, consideration of the governor, 
so the governor can send the bill for the reconsideration okay however if state legislative assembly passes the very same bill with or without amendments and sent for the governor's assent the governor must give his assent however so here we need to understand the other thing so when assembly passes a bill and send the bill for the governor's assent and governor reserved the bill or referred the bill for the president so the president may send the bill for the reconsideration of the state legislative assembly however if state legislative assembly passes the very same bill with or without amendments the president is not under any obligation to give his assent to the particular bill passed by the state legislative assembly even after the reconsideration okay so this is what the constitution has been saying about these bills now let's move on to the next very important article so that is with respect to india sri lanka fisherman issue so this is also one of the long standing issue between india and sri lanka so it says 21 tamil nadu fishermen were arrested by lankan navy sri lankan navy two trawlers were impounded okay so you need to understand the border between india and sri lanka here and most of the fishermen so that were arrested by sri lankan navy or tamil nadu fishermen and we will briefly understand the context of this issue okay so if you look at the fisherman issue between india and sri lanka a maritime dispute between india and sri lanka remains unresolved despite of 47 years uh, uh, you know there was an agreement 47 years ago okay so there was an agreement in 1974 so that agreement is between india and sri lanka maritime boundary agreement so that agreement was signed and indian fishermen tend to cross the maritime border okay so tend to cross the marit maritime border and they enter into sri lanka in into the park strait because of better fish catch in the park strait so which in turn leads to the assaults by the sri lankan navy arrest assaults and even opening fire on the indian uh, fishermen by the sri lankan navy because the indian fishermen are very often crossing the border this particular border of india sri lanka maritime uh, maritime border or boundary of 1974 so that leads to the arrest and even assault by the sri lankan navy on indian fishermen so we will briefly understand the story behind the fisherman issue so we all know that india and sri lanka are close neighbors they have been enjoying friendly ties so for centuries india and sri lankan fishermen communities have been fishing in each other's waters without having any conflict however this particular scenario has been changed Uh, when india and sri lanka have signed this particular maritime boundary agreement of 1974-76 so in this year india and sri lanka have signed the maritime boundary agreement so this agreement has defined their respective understanding of the international maritime boundary between the two countries okay so that has demarcated the boundary between india and sri lanka however the idea behind these agreements were that they would facilitate the law enforcement age uh, law enforcement in the waters and at the same time the resource management in the uh, ecologically sensitive park strait so this this particular park strait is located between india and sri lanka so that is uh, one of the uh, you know biodiverse and rich biodiverse region and ecologically sensitive region between india and sri lanka and this park strait is known for a, a very rich fish catch abundant fish catch and because of that reason indian fishermen or tamil nadu fishermen very often crossing this border and entering into the sri lanka waters into the park strait so that has led to this particular issue so though these agreements or through these agreements the kachatheevu island was ceded to sri lanka by the indian government okay so through this india sri lanka maritime boundary agreement 1974 76 the kachatheevu island this is a very important island and this island is also very often in use so this kachatheevu island was ceded to sri lanka by indian government so this was ceded without consulting the tamil nadu state government okay so because of that reason it is in news continuously however despite these maritime agreements 
there was no well defined maritime boundary between these two countries okay so there was no well defined maritime agreement and fishermen very often don't know about these maritime borders and they just cross into the waters of other countries and that is also happening with respect to pakistan so this has been leading to indian fishermen trespassing into sri lankan waters in search of better cash so we all know that if you look at the eastern coast the fish population has been dwindling fast or depleting at a faster pace so because of that reason the indian fishermen have been entering into the sri lankan waters so between 1983 and 2019 indian fishermen had easier access to the sri lankan waters and maritime boundary in park strait was not heavily guarded because of the ltte presence of ltte in the northern sri lanka so uh, the park strait was not heavily guarded and at the same time indian fishermen also easily access the park strait and they they also used to get better fish catch and at the same time because of the security concerns sri lankan navy not allowed the sri lankan fishermen to uh, venture into fishing in the park strait and that ultimately benefited the indian fishermen so however after uh, the war over the ltte has ended war over the ltt has ended the sri lankan navy's security in this particular region or it has tightened its overall surveillance in the region in and around the park strait so uh, in the last few decades fish and aquatic life in the indian continental shelf has been depleting at a faster pace so because of this reason more and more fishermen enter enter into the sri lankan waters and they also resort to the use of modern uh, fishing trolleys in uh, you know very often lankan fishermen do not have so when lankan fishermen do not have the advanced and modern fishing facilities so this will provide an edge to the indian fishermen so they will have better fish better fish so that is a concern because uh for the sri lanka because indian fishermen with better fishing infrastructure have been uh impacting the fish population in the sri lankan waters and that impacts the livelihood of sri lankan fishermen so since 2009 sri lankan navy has strengthened its surveillance in the northern maritime boundary to halt the potential uh, return of tamil insurgents sri lankan navy still believes that the tamil insurgent would uh return back would come back into sri lanka so because of that reason they have increased the maritime surveillance over the northern port so because of that reason and increased venturing of indian fishermen into sri lankan waters have led to the frequent uh, conflicts uh, between these two uh, uh, forces okay so uh, what should be the way forward in this context so sri lanka has suggested joint patrols and operations between two countries to guarantee effective results on illegal fishing and trespassing and there is a need for a protocol uh, that should be signed immediately for joint patrolling and that could prevent indian fishermen venturing into the sri lankan waters so despite having met more than uh, once since 2016 there was no solution at that is being finalized so irrespective of the circumstances the potential solution to the dispute relies on response from the respective governments of india and sri lanka there should be a political will on the part of these two countries to immediately sign an agreement on this so that uh, they can protect the livelihoods of the fishermen in both these countries and also reduce the arrests and attacks by the sri lankan navy on indian fishermen so if both countries are unable to settle this particular dispute then they could seek assistance from the international maritime experts through the mediation of united nations that could peacefully settle this is, uh, issue so uh, if you look at the kachatiwo island it is located between india and sri lanka so in this region okay so it is located between india and sri lanka uh, you know this is the park strait okay so that's all in this lecture and thank you so much please subscribe to our youtube channel and also hit the like button if you really like our work thank you